Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Bill Spencer. In our show this week, we'll take a look at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum's ninth annual legislative briefing on renewable energy in Hawaii. We'll hear the remarks of the leaders of our energy community on the status of our move to clean energy, how we're doing, and where we're going. As in previous years, the Energy Policy Forum's legislative briefing took place in the Capitol Auditorium and was well attended by government, industry, and the public. Now in the fifth year after the Clean Energy Initiative was rolled out in 2008, the Forum wanted to tackle some of the challenges we've experienced in the development of clean energy and to identify where we are on the continuum. We are in a new time when we must deal with issues in leadership, determining what resources to develop, who will develop them, at what cost and in what proportions, and how we will meet our goals, make ourselves independent of oil, and at the same time build clean energy infrastructure at prices we can afford. First, we had opening remarks from Denny Kaufman, Chair of the House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee. You know, at the federal level with the retirement of Senator Akaka and the passing of Senator Inouye, we now find our state being represented by two new senators and a new member of the House of Representatives. Three of our four congressional officers are new to the job and low on seniority. Senator Brian Schatz, while serving as our Lieutenant Governor, was the Governor's primary point person on energy projects and related issues. His move to Washington has both a good news and a bad news connotation for our state. The good news is that we now have a U.S. Senator who understands our energy issues and can be well informed as an advocate for the, at the federal level for us. The bad news is that we now have to find his replacement and probably provide some training and help for that person. At the state level, the House is completely reorganized with a new speaker and many new committee chairmen. I will not be returning as the chair of the Energy and Environmental Protection Committee. However, I will remain active on the committee and my focus will remain the same on energy policy and issues. Also at the state level, uh, we've just heard the announcement that Tesoro will stop refinery operations in April and they'll become a terminal operator. Um, while we really don't know the impact of that, I think there will be some changes that are going to follow up and impact all of us. Then we heard from Mike Hamnett and Carl Friedman of the Forum about the current state of clean energy in Hawaii and about the Forum's energy metrics project. Uh, as most of you know, the Forum uh, adopted a vision for clean energy for Hawaii smart energy solutions to sustain a healthy, prosperous, and secure Hawaii. It's pretty simple and there's, pretty, there's been agreement on that for many years. The state energy goals were uh, really codified in uh, the renewable portfolio standards and then the uh, ener uh, efficiency portfolio standards, standards with an energy goal of 70% clean energy by 2030. Uh, in, elec in electricity, that's 40% uh, from renewables and 30% from energy efficiency. In transportation, 70% from efficiency is what's looked at. Presentations today are going to uh, sort of give us an update on, on one, how we're doing, but also uh, how we're going to be uh, measuring our progress as we move forward. We have been making uh, progress in electricity. Electricity, as I said, is only a third of the problem. There were some 40 projects, in, renewable energy projects in the pipeline, uh, but now we're facing some big decisions. We've gotten all the low-hanging fruit, and we're looking at neighbor island wind and cable as a decision that's going to have to be made in the next couple of years, uh, biofuels and investments in that, and what kind of incentives are going to be provided, and the expansion of geothermal. Challenges, we have a lot of challenges in energy efficiency, and Ray Starling is going to tell us about that. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick report on a, an ongoing project to uh, develop metrics and status reports. Basically, the questions we're trying to address is, uh, are we making progress towards our clean energy goals? Are we attaining the underlying objectives that are the reasons for our investments in uh, a clean energy transition? And the real focus of this project is how we are going to measure that progress. Are we reducing our carbon footprint? Are we reducing the export of the something like six or seven billion dollars we spend on fuel every year? Are we reducing the volatility of our energy costs? 
Are we creating green jobs for people here in the state of Hawaii? Are we increasing the reliability of our fuel supply? And in all of this, are we maintaining uh, costs to the people the, who live here uh, to make uh, energy services affordable? And are we reducing environmental impacts? In order to answer all of those questions, we need to have good information, and we need to have a way to frame that information in a way that is meaningful to inform good decisions regarding investments, policies, and laws. Phase one of this project started with the stakeholder group. We identified about 20 individual metrics uh, in four categories. Uh, we're now in the middle of phase two. Ray Starling of Hawaii Energy then updated us on efforts to improve energy efficiency. As far as the good news, Hawaii Energy, or the Public Benefits uh, Fee Administrator, uh, was really a good program that was set up uh, well by the legislature. It, it's uh, funded uh, well, it's steady funding. Uh, it's got great leadership reporting directly to the PUC. We've got uh, Jim Flanagan in the audience today, uh, our, our independent contract manager. All of these things come together to really give us a strong program doing energy efficiency for uh, the, uh, basically the, the territories covered by Hawaiian Electric. That's the good news. The bad news is that uh, Hawaii's Ener Hawaii Energy's electric efficiency responsibilities only cover 25 percent of the oil pie. Uh, it, it, there's 75 percent of that pie that doesn't get any attention from us. Uh, it's, it was uh, set up to basically uh, aim at, uh, at electric efficiency and the, uh, the result is there are a lot of other things that are not getting the kind of attention that we give to electric uh, efficiency. Energy transportation panelists Laura Dierenfeld and Maria Tomei then discussed the challenges we have had in moving to clean energy in transportation and what we can do about it. Thank you. Transportation, energy, and land use are each extremely important and substantial topics. Their impacts on each other and reliance upon each other affect federal, state, county, and many, many personal decisions. In the next few minutes, we'll take a very high level look at some current activities. Let's start by looking at the energy used in the transportation sector. Transportation is the major user of petroleum, globally, nationally, and in Hawaii. In Hawaii, the demand for ground transportation fuels, mostly gasoline, and air transportation fuels, i.e. jet fuel, are each about equal to the electricity sector and the amount of petroleum used. And this is like the third or fourth time you've heard this statistic. <laughs> Interesting developments are underway in alternative jet fuels. In the interest of time, however, the rest of this presentation will focus on the ground transportation sector. Hawaii cannot transform to 70% clean energy by 2030 without tremendous progress in reducing the amount of petroleum needed in the ground transportation sector. Fuel, although critical to the functioning of the transportation system, is often taken for granted. But what happens when it becomes more expensive? Can price spikes increase transit ridership and bicycling? Or can energy policies, such as taxes or incentives, affect the transportation system? And what would be the impact in Hawaii if there was a fuel supply disruption? In 2008, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum conducted a transportation efficiency study that identified the importance of mode choice, fuel efficiency, and diversification of energy sources. Then we had remarks about a critically important issue, the challenge of energy leadership in our state. This morning we had a pretty lively um, photovoltaic um, roundtable discussion uh, at Pacific Business News. We have these uh, once a month. We tackled PV this morning and you know, that's one of the um, industries that has had a lot of um, uh, attention, a lot of issues in that industry. Uh, we usually have those round tables. We set it for one hour. It spilled over to an, two hours and two and a half hours. Uh, so you can see right there that, uh, that these uh, PV contractors, PV stakeholders, they have a lot of issues. And especially with the legislative session coming up, um, there should to be more um, talk from them. Um, so I want to start out by telling you, but when I first uh, start writing out a story, 
you know, a good portion of it um, is reserved for um, the challenges that are uh, being faced by, like I said, the PV industry, the wind industry, um, biomass, uh, geothermal, and so forth. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that a lot of these industries going in already know that there's these issues such as um, financing and permitting and you know costs associated with labor um, and land. Um, you know, right at the top is the solar PV guys uh, with their uh, permitting challenge that they faced. Uh, what they told me this morning is that with the city and county of Honolulu's unveiling of their online permitting system, it has drastically helped out um, that process. Jay asked me to talk a little bit about, about leadership, and <clears throat> I'm thinking in those terms of political leadership. And one of the uh, key things that I've always, I've come to believe and come to see, and I'm sure my legislative friends will maybe agree, maybe not agree, is that by definition, political leadership has a short time frame. If you're a two-year uh, representative, a four-year senator, or a four-year governor, six-year senator, whatever you are, that is your time frame. If you can't think really beyond that time frame because if you believe you have something to offer the public, you have to get reelected. And to get reelected, you have to do things within the time frame of when you're in office. So it becomes very difficult for uh, political leadership to see beyond its own term into the future. Uh, that's why I thought the, uh, the Clean Energy Initiative was really remarkable in that it projected beyond the political time frames of anyone who is then in office, including Governor Lingle. Uh, it's quite, and it was really amazing. So the second step then is, fine, we can write a piece of paper and we can set up a, a series of uh, idealized goals, what we're going to do over the next 20 years, but can we take the steps, and sometimes painful steps, to accomplish those goals within the term of our, of our current uh, term. And that's the difficult thing. I'm thinking back to um, the 70s when we had the oil shock. And Hawaii went on a binge of getting itself off its dependence on then very expensive oil. I remember at one point uh, they were going to do a dramatic thing. They were going to show, take as a prototype or as an example, Molokai, and make it the first completely non-fossil uh, fuel dependent jurisdiction in the nation. And it was possible. They had wind energy, they had um, all kinds of things they could do, and this would be a demonstration of what Hawaii could do. Well, then oil prices came down a little bit, and the steam went out of it, so to speak. And it was kind of disappointing. So you, you, you have to watch what, what, takes, what leadership requires is to do the hard things when the crisis is not upon us. Then we heard from Brad Rockwell of Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, Robbie Am of Hawaiian Electric, and Mina Morita, Chair of the Public Utilities Commission, on the complexities of deciding on and implementing an acceptable mix of clean energy resources. Uh, I'm here to talk just uh, on three main points, and I've got three slides to show you a little bit about Kauai's energy mix. And uh, the three main points are really, what have we done, uh, what's next, and where is that going to leave us? And uh, as you can see on the, on the slide, just a few years ago, we were about 95% oil and 5% other. And for Kauai, that, uh, that other part was the hydro. And um, that was largely due to the loss of plantations coming out. So we had gotten to sort of a low point in our history in the energy mix there. Um, where we stand today, which isn't really shown there, it's kind of the in-between, is that mix is about 90-10 now. So we're making progress. Um, that's been largely through a huge increase in solar. Uh, the hydro, the plantation hydro that, that we always had is still there, and we've increased solar quite a bit. And we've been able to do that because that's sort of the easy stuff that's out there. Everyone likes it. Permitting's not a challenge. You don't have to uh, fight community will. And so we've gone big with solar. And, and you can see with the projects that we've brought on and a couple that we have in active development, along with a, a biomass plant that, we, that should be starting construction any week now, uh, we're set to be in 2015, that's about a 35%, 65% mix. The vulnerability issues are huge. You know, we can make assurances to you about how it looks like petroleum, at least in the short term, can be brought in, whether Tesoro operates a refinery or they or a successor operates a terminal operation, but there is no question that Hawaii's vulnerability, as long as our fuel supplies come from offshore, remains very high. And we shouldn't kid ourselves about that. So the goal of having 
Um, our energy come from here is, is very important. So, I, you know, I'm, we talked about this as we prep for this. <clears throat> the clean energy story as far as Hawaiian Electric is concerned, and we cover all the islands in the chain other than uh, Kauai, um, is really, I think, in two parts or two chapters. Part one is the initial set of bids and contracts we got. And essentially, with some exceptions, we took basically anything that was offered to us. Um, because Hawaii at the time was so low in its RPS numbers that everything was up. Um, and at this point, um, we're, we're basically nearly done with that. Um, the, the pipeline has largely been used up. We will pass Hawaii's 15% goal um, by the end of this year. I mean, our 2015 goal will be met by this year and probably exceeded by a couple percentage points. That's the good news. Bad news is, other than what's already assuming who Honua comes online on the Big Island this year, that's it. AKP and Hawaii Bioenergies, Biofuels Contracts, the Lanai 200, and OTEC International. As far as large-scale commercial projects, that's the pipeline. So if we're going to try to reach the 2020 goals, and remember in 2020 we jumped by 10%. We go from 15 to 25%. A huge leap, almost doubling everything we've done. During 2002, with the passage of the first RPS goals and net energy metering bills, I believe this was the first attempt to implement and measure Hawaii's progress towards a diverse energy resource mix. Um, it's hard to believe, but at that time, the RPS law was, had um, set very modest goals of 7% of net electricity sales by 2003, 8% by 2005, and 9% by 2010, and with just a reporting requirement by the utilities, oh, I'm sorry, and um, no penalties if the utilities did not meet the goals. Net metering maximum penetration was set at 0.5% of system peak, um, system peak demand. So I think we've come a long way since uh, 2002. So between 2002 and 2012, especially with the signing of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative Agreement in 2008, the sub subsequent energy agreement, and amendments to the RPS to cre create an enforceable mandate with highly lucrative tax credits and increased levels of net metering penetration, a heavy emphasis was placed on renewable energy generation in addressing the resource mix. Finally, we heard from cognizant legislators on one of the most pressing questions of all. Can we meet our clean energy goals and at the same time balance the state budget? Over the last several years, instead of looking at a deficit going into a legislative session uh, going back to 2007, 2008, we're actually looking at some very positive balances. Uh, we left the last fiscal year uh, several million dollar uh, positive balance. Uh, projected balances right now give us a pretty firm balance in 2013 and 2014. Uh, just some high points, uh, between 2011 and 2012 uh, fiscal year, uh, we actually went up about 10 uh, 10%. Uh, over previous uh, years as far as general fund tax collections. Um, uh, for the GET, which is about half of all state tax revenues, uh, we went up at about 8% from 2011 to 2012. Uh, visitor accounts, as you all know, has, has uh, hit, hit a new high mark of about 6% growth uh, over the last two years. And from July 12th, uh, uh, the current fiscal year, GET collections are up about 12% uh, through November and income tax about 13%. So all the signs are there for positive growth. We, we don't see any uh, uh, decline in our vis visitor accounts. Uh, we're expanding to Asia. We sp new routes are going to China, uh, to Japan. Uh, the Australians are coming down to visit us, or coming up to visit us. Canadians are coming down to visit us. And everything seems set to be on record courses. So very positive, very positive signs are out there. So I'll just be talking a little bit about uh, the state financial plan and, and what the um, finances of the state kind of looks like. Uh, you know, after, after um, for the past four years, you, as you all have uh, been aware, the state has 
um, been looking at significant budget reductions. Uh, last year for the first year, um, we had actually had the opportunity to make strategic investments uh, in our communities and we uh, did carefully. This, this new biennium for the first time, the economy uh, has somewhat stabilized and um, for the second year in a row, we do see um, growth in revenues. Um, although it's not really an opportunity for um, um, cartwheels or, or handstands because we are um, we are basically um, treading water. If you look at if you look at the current revenue stream that the state takes in, and you just made the assumption that we're status quo with government, uh, so we're not doing anything new. We just look at continuing programs. Uh, at the funding levels that they were in the past. So no new changes, no new programs, um, nothing. We are uh, breaking even. The proceeding was closed by remarks from Senator Mike Gabbard, chair of the Senate Energy and Environmental Committee, who had just returned from a trip to Washington to visit his daughter, Tulsi Gabbard, our new congresswoman from Hawaii. I've decided to do something. I'm gonna sing my closing remarks. <laughs> The speakers and attendees then retired to the third floor lanai of the Capitol to network and have a nice lunch with a broad representation of our state's energy pace setters and experts. On the eve of the 2013 legislative session, the forum's ninth energy legislative briefing was focused on giving government, industry, and the public an honest, accurate, and candid view of where we are on the way to meeting our goals, and it did just that. Just as our clean energy initiative changes going forward, so does the forum, as it must, to inform its stakeholders what's going on in our state of energy and what must be done to achieve our goals, protect our environment, and serve the needs of the public. The forum is alive and well, and through its efforts in these briefings and otherwise, our understanding and appreciation of this critical initiative is also alive and well. For more information about the forum and about clean energy in Hawaii, See hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu. Whatever you do, make sure to follow the action in clean energy as this important initiative unfolds and support it whenever and wherever you can. Remember, building clean energy for Hawaii requires us to build an entirely new infrastructure. This will be a better infrastructure and will give us independence from increasing oil prices, but it will cost money. If we want this independence, we'll have to pay those costs. Clean energy is our highest priority, essential to maintaining our way of life. So this is money well spent.
And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. drive time radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week. Tune in to 760 AM for great shows now including a weekly show on energy by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Raise your awareness on tech, energy, Asia, and more on ThinkTech Radio. On January 24th, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present the 2013 Annual Entrepreneur of the Year and Deal of the Year Awards at a luncheon program at the Plaza Club. Sign up for these programs on hvca.org. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the Gas Company, a proponent of the Liquefied Natural Gas Initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Okay, Bill. That wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Bill does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Jay. For lots more of ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a sponsor or a volunteer and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Bill Spencer. Aloha, everyone. ThinkTech is awesome. My name is DJ. Mm-hmm.